Alright, welcome everyone to Poco Traveler. Today we're going to do our March 2024 updates, mostly in the downtown Cleveland area, but we'll touch on some other topics too. Uh, just give me one second to, uh, anytime I start one of these streams, I do a quick little behind the scenes check to make sure that we're actually live. So let me do that for a second. Alright, I think that looks good, and I made sure it's public, because I was practicing earlier with unlisted video, so <laughs> would hate to be unlisted and not uh, not live for this. I also tried to come up with a new template format for if I do these type of presentations at the computer, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, so this is like the introduction slide that I came up with, and then we'll sort of move, start moving on to the rest of our topics. And you won't, you'll see my face minimize, if this works correctly, down to the lower right hand corner of the screen. And then on the far right side of your screen, you'll see a sidebar, sort of how like news broadcast will do things, where it'll go in order of the topics that we plan on covering, and then we'll start with the public square bollards, or the barriers that have been long plaguing Cleveland's public square. So let's jump right to that. Uh, sorry, give me a second. I guess these bullet points on the pasting didn't work too well. So we're jumping over to Twitter. You can see from the Cleveland Public Square account on March 25th, that would be yesterday, they held a ceremony where they started removing the bollards or barriers that were in public square since they first went up many many years ago I think it was like seven or eight years ago that was back when they redesigned public square and changed everything uh, Zytra says Frederick bike shop is closing in the fall you know what's funny you're saying that because I'll give you a sneak peek down to my little note sheet here <laughs> that's gonna be toward the bottom of my topics Frederick bike shop closing so we'll uh, we'll get to that. But yeah, there were a little people, uh, some people complaining <laughs> online about the ceremony itself because St. Patrick's Day was in Cleveland uh, a couple weeks ago, and for the past couple of years, or maybe every year, they what they do is they remove these, you know, solid barriers that you're seeing right here, these concrete barriers that are in Public Square. They remove them and then they put them back, which is fine if they're going to keep them there, but they had just removed them like two weeks ago, and then they put one, two, three of these back just so they could hold this ceremony like two weeks later, meaning yesterday, to ceremoniously like remove them and have people in attendance. So I guess people, some people are complaining like, oh, you know, they're wasting money by putting the barriers back, taking them and doing this show for no reason, which I understand, but it was still kind of fun that they had like a little ceremony to get rid of them. Uh, you can see an up-close shot, Mayor Bibb was there, they had other city, city people there. And you can see this little video here. So that was part of the ceremony, removing the barriers. I think I have another uh, tweet I can jump to here. Let's see here if I can pull it up. This is another short video clip. Alright, so yeah, you get the point of it, that they were making a spectacle of it. Now, the plan for these barriers... Now, let me go back to the previous one, throw up a screenshot, is... Well, first let's backtrack to December 2022. That's when $3.5 million in funding was secured 
for these barriers to be replaced and have a new bollard system go up in 2023. So we were expecting that in 2023, but it never happened. <laughs> so I think the word that I read through some other articles was there were some supply chain issues and that was the delay and it wasn't you know any any other reason. Uh, so now the story is they've officially removed the barrier. So in Public Square there are no barriers. I believe they are rerouting buses along the square, meaning I think the buses are already are not going through the square in anticipation for the construction that's going to take place. So when I first heard that they were doing this yesterday, my first thought was, oh geez, are they closing Public Square off to uh, pedestrians and visitors? Because my first thought was, well gee, the uh, solar eclipse coming up on April 8th and how many visitors are going to be coming to downtown Cleveland but another article I read online said that construction is going to begin on April 9th one day after the solar eclipse so they must be anticipating that the big crowds of people coming for the eclipse and for progressive field for opening day on April 8th you know there's probably going to be a lot of people gathering in public square and other places uh, for that viewing so it, it, that's a good thing that the construction isn't starting until April 9th and then once that construction starts it's going to continue through the end of June or beginning of July and then the com the project should be completed there's also a little other things like you're supposed to do something like I'm not quite sure what this means but it's said a slightly raised crosswalk in addition to uh, I think painted bike lanes uh, going down Superior for that stretch. Again, well, I haven't seen renderings of that or know exactly what that means, but that's part of uh, what I read in that description of it. So yeah, it's exciting to see that that's finally finally going to come to fruition. So, our next topic of discussion, and let me practice uh, setting this up here on the right side. You should see see how Public Square Bollards is highlighted in blue. If I do this right, uh, it should flash to the next topic, Brown Stadium. <laughs> so let's go ahead and talk about the latest with Cleveland Brown Stadium. I have a Word document that I have uh, some hyperlinks saved in, so that's why my eyes are darting to the right so I can click on them and reference them. By the way, this is the Brown's blog that I've operated or wrote for since the year 2006, so a long, long time continuing to do so. But back in February, uh, some news came out that the Cleveland Browns might be looking to move Brown Stadium in the future by building a new stadium out by Cleveland Hopkins International Airport. So back when that happened, that was interesting for me to look at, okay, where would the possible stadium go and they purchased or sorry I don't know if they've officially purchased it yet but back in February they were close to having a purchasing agreement for the site of where two four former Ford motor plants were located in Brook Park Ohio so I had this little image slider here but let's go back if you can imagine this blue area where it says Cleveland Inter Hopkins International Airport that's where Cleveland Hopkins Airport is right now and then that red area that I have at the bottom right corner is the Brook Park RTA Rapid Station. So the spot that you see in orange would be the 176 acres of land for a possible new Browns Stadium. And this slider that goes back and forth just kind of shows the before and after, well not really before and after, but what it currently looks like and then just the overlaid of where that would be. And then if you can make it out really tiny and green in this uh, photo here, there's that's where Brown's headquarters is in Berea. So the Berea headquarters wouldn't be too far from this possible site. Now back in February, the Haslam's weren't offering too much word on whether or not this was like a serious candidate. I think this team may have released a statement saying that they were exploring options but no definitive decisions, decisions had been made. But this week, the NFL annual owners meetings are taking place down in Orlando, Florida. And that's always a good time to get quotes from owners on various topics or they vote on rule changes. Like the NFL just approved a new kickoff rule for this upcoming season, which is going to 
be a definitely a topic of conversation among fans curious to see that for football but as far as the city of Cleveland goes in Brown Stadium the Haslam's did talk to a few reporters and they confirmed that there's basically two options that they're seriously considering right now one of the options would be to have one billion dollars needed to renovate the current stadium and maybe parts around the stadium to try to bring it up to date because it's kind of bland in general. I read online there's also issues with if they want to develop more of the lakefront and have uh, maybe more restaurants and other things just to make it more of a you know fun atmosphere then they may have to take a lot of those parking lots that are down there and if they build on top of those they would still need to have parking in some fashion so then they would need to build parking structures that have multiple levels and that would cost more money so there's a lot of layers to it but in Brook Park uh, let me jump over to this other uh, actually I don't know if I have the article handy but let me go to the website on Neo Neotrans I always advocate for this blog Neotrans they do a tremendous job of uh, covering a lot of in-depth stories related to Cleveland and construction projects but they also had this revised or possible as you can see unofficial site plan for a potential Cleveland Brown Stadium in Berea or sorry in Brook Park and you can see this is similar to what I showed earlier but the airport it would be over here this is where like the Ford motor former Ford motor plant things would be so you can imagine this could be where they put the stadium all these little orange buildings could be stadium village mixed-use development so if you get any of you watched my videos from St. Louis last year when I was at my conference I showed off ballpark village that is outside of the St. Louis Cardinals baseball stadium and to me when I saw that that was sort of like the blueprint for wow you know that's something very exciting but the difference is that was embedded in downtown St. Louis. Here we're talking about putting it all the way in a suburb, still in Cuyahoga County, but you know, it's a different thing to consider. But one of the things that's probably also attractive to the Haslam's would be that you have all this extra space that would just be used for flat surface parking lots, so they wouldn't have to waste money on building parking structures and things like that. Uh, and I think I mentioned this would, this plan if they went with this is estimated to cost about 2.1 billion dollars and if they went with this it would be a domed structure and that's what the Haslam's are weighing do they do a domed structure here because then they could attract more even though that downtown Cleveland is getting the women's final four for the NCAA right now maybe in the future they can attract more NCAA games and events maybe they can attract uh, who knows who knows a whole host of other events that they couldn't can't do right now with without a dome being in downtown at the current stadium uh, let's see here do I have any other notes on the Browns that's about it right now one one thing I did forget to mention that's a uh, I forgot to uh, put in my little write up here the current Cleveland Browns stadium on the lakefront is getting WWE SummerSlam this coming summer uh, near the beginning of August so that's a huge get for the city of Cleveland and Brown Stadium so it is one one usage of it but again they're looking for year-round usage because if they wanted to hold WrestleMania here for example which is the biggest event coming up the beginning of April they may not risk ever wanting to do that in downtown Cleveland because it could still be freezing cold at that time of year Whereas you move it out here, have it have it in a dome, you could really you know attract that type of event. So next up on our list of topics is baseball renovation. So April eighth is coming up, which is going to be opening day for the Cleveland Guardians. So they need to move fast on the remaining renovations. Now there's not not a lot of updated blueprints that we've seen online, but I did try to scour Twitter or X and find as many interesting things as I could. So this account here, O Sports Arch, uh, I think that, yeah, it was actually today they posted 
an up close shot of the blue seating that is now in the lower bowl. So this is the green seating that has been the color scheme for as far as I know since the stadium opened back when it was Jacobs Field. But they've undergone uh, a big change to have the blue seats. So right now they're only occupying uh, most of the lower bowl. In future years I believe they're going to probably next off season if I had to guess replace the remaining seats so they, that way the entire progressive field will be all blue but then they also had like an up close shot of you know probably the additional logos and just the seats in general being brand new it'll take some time getting used to I'm used to growing up seeing that constant green look at progressive field but part of the upgrades that they're doing another thing I saw on Twitter was this person posted that they're really kind of overdoing it with the progressive signage now progressive of course is the sponsor of progressive field so progressive wants their branding everywhere but this is what we're used to seeing right here where it says progressive field and the Guardians logo underneath it but if you look right below that now when you are welcome in they also have welcome to progressive field and as of March 22nd which was earlier uh, I guess late last week you could see up above at the top of the stadium they're also putting progressive and it's gonna say field so it seems like they're overdoing it a bit to say progressive field progressive field welcome to progressive field I mean the signage is like a bit overkill but that's still it's always fun to look at uh, what's different over the span of time. I also saw this from a couple of weeks ago. So granted, this is March 14th. Today's March 26th. So we've had at least, you know, about two weeks of progress since then, or since uh, these pictures were taken. But this still gives us a little bit of a snapshot of some of the updates, a, better, a different view of which seats were exactly converted to blue and which ones are still green. Now, at the, during the season, it's probably not going to matter so much because these are the seats that are mostly filled. You'll see fans sitting in them. You're not going to really see the disparity between blue, blue and green unless the stadium's empty. Uh, this is one of the renovations, I'm assuming, to the former Terrace Club. Although, if I'm not mistaken, I thought this portion is not supposed to be done until the following offseason but I think that's some of the progress that's been done on that, where eventually they're going to make it more of an outdoor or open-air club instead of having the glass there. This is one of the sections where they used to have those... You know, many years ago they renovated the stadium, and in the upper deck they converted it to those big blocks where you could stand out on the ledge, but no one really ever used them, and it was kind of just a spot where they slapped some advertisements, but now... They got rid of all those seats, you know, flattened things out, and are going to have more of a restaurant and bar scene. As you can see, two weeks ago, there's still aesthetically a lot of progress to be made, but I'm sure they're working around the clock to get all of that finished and worked out. And this is another angle. Oh, you can see up here, this is what I was talking about, where those blocks used to be. Now, personally, to me, from, again, a design perspective, it granted I know they're going with a new concept and this right here is where that flat area is going to be but it also looks weird to just have like nothing here it looks like someone took their fist and like punched a hole through the seats and it's like where, where are they at so I don't know if they have a plan to like fill that in with something but it does look like a little bit unusual and uh, I believe they're doing a similar thing with the left field area but I'm not sure if that's where this particular picture is from or if this is from the Terrace Club section. Uh, I've got one more thing related to Progressive Field, and this is related to an overhead perspective. Well, first off, it's cool to see an up a drone footage of the up-close perspective of those guardians of traffic on the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. But this video 
Again, it doesn't show you a ton because it's overhead, meaning it doesn't show you up close, but it sort of gives you some perspective of how the stadium looks. And this one, I believe, was shot within the past day or two. Yeah, there, there's a sh overhead shot of what I was referring to and the crews continuing to work on it. Alrighty, so next topic after the Guardians is the solar eclipse which is the big exciting event April 8th once in a lifetime let me pull up one of the solar eclipse websites while I talk about this so this is going to be a historic once in a lifetime opportunity for us to get to see a total solar eclipse and passing through Cleveland the last total solar eclipse in Ohio was in 1806 and the next time this will be visible in Cleveland specifically is the year 2,444. So unless, unless some magic scientific uh, thing to prolong life comes along, none of us will be around for the, the next total solar eclipse in Cleveland. So savor this for what it's worth. And I'm excited to be there uh, filming this on April 8th. I'm not sure, I mean, in my mind, I'm going to attempt a live stream while I'm in downtown Cleveland that day, but they're expecting beyond you know all the normal Northeast Ohio residents, they're expecting 200,000 visitors probably to come specifically to downtown Cleveland and be in the area to witness uh, that span when the eclipse is happening. So when you have that surge of people, I just don't know if the you know, cellular towers are going to be too congested to handle the live stream. So again, I will attempt it, but there's no way that I want to risk, like, not filming it. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the live stream going in one hand, and then have my other, uh, you've, you guys have seen it before, I don't think I have it in my immediate grasp right now, but my other stick camera that records all of my high quality footage. So that way I at least will have that as a backup plan, because I definitely want to document this historic event and have that video available for the channel. But let's go through this website real quick on the NASA website. It's talking about the total eclipse, where and when. They've got a nice little eclipse ex explorer here that spans through the United States of America. Uh, so there are a few big cities that are fortunate to be capturing this, like Dallas, but then Cleveland's one of the other big cities. It doesn't show it up here, but Buffalo's also included in that. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why Cleveland is going to be getting a lot of visitors, because it's right in that path of totality. And if we keep scrolling down, uh, you know, you can read more about the event itself. They have a video that talks about it. But this table right here is talking about the cities that are going to get the totality. So you see like again, Dallas, Texas, Little Rock, Arkansas, there's Cleveland, Ohio, Erie, Pennsylvania, Buffalo, New York, uh, and then Caribou, Maine. But let's focus specifically on Cleveland, Ohio right here. Uh, the partial eclipse, meaning technically it'll, the city will be affected by a little bit, is about 2 o'clock at 1.59 p.m. Eastern on April 8th. But the totality, this is the key window, totality beginning at 3.13 p.m. and ending at 3.17 p.m. and then the partial ending a little bit later. So that this window right here from 3.13 p.m. to 3.17 p.m., that's like the moment that you want to capture. Hopefully it's a nice weather day. You'd hate for it to be like rain or some thunderstorm or overcast and it kind of like affects this once in a lifetime opportunity. But uh, yeah, I'm really, really excited to be part of this and see it. And the Cleveland Guardians are holding their home opener on that same day. And initially, or usually, those games would start around like 2 o'clock or so. But because uh, of the eclipse happening this day, they decided to delay the start of the game. So the start of the game is not going to be until like 5, sometime after 5 o'clock p.m. So it'll be two hours afterward. It'll give people plenty of time to see the eclipse and digest it and maybe you know traffic to 
settle down a little bit and people get to get ready for seeing opening day instead. Uh, there's also some other events happening in downtown Cleveland during that time in the lead up to this. For example, at the Great Lakes Science Center, they're holding a three-day event from April 6th to April 8th. And it's just talk, it's called Total Eclipse Fest 2024. So this might be something I check out if I am able to. Uh, if we read real quick, three-day celebration at North Coast Harbor in downtown Cleveland. Free outdoor family-friendly science and arts festival featuring concerts, performances, speakers, hands-on activities, etc. So they're taking part of it. I also know NASA, or not NASA, the Great Lakes Science Center is one of the places selling solar eclipse glasses for a dollar, I think they're a dollar ninety-nine. But there's other places selling them too. I think I'm going to grab my pair from uh, Cleveland State because they were offering it to people who uh, work there. There's also Solar Fest that's taking place at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. A four day celebration from Friday, April 5th to Monday, April 8th. Uh, and they're, they're talking about they're offering their most expanded hours in history. Going to be open from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. during the event weekend. Uh, I don't know 100% what they're going to have, but they talk about things like live music, trivia contests, other programs. So might be something to experience. I think they have more details on day by day if you go to the website and check it out. And then what's the last thing I have here? Oh yeah, Downtown Cleveland on their website just has a good synopsis of what to expect. Talking about uh, the eclipse immediately follows Cleveland hosting, hosting the Final Four for the women's NCAA the Cleveland International Film Festival is going to be taking place during the same span, April 3rd to the 13th. So it's like, this is a jam-packed start of April for the city of Cleveland. Uh, definitely, yeah, you want to make sure you get those glasses. Like, if you're, if you're going to be trying to view this in Cleveland, you don't want to do, like, permanent damage to your eyes or risk going blind or something. You know, as cheap as they are, they do the job and everyone's going to be wearing them. So be sure to grab that. They talk about how it's expected that Mall B and Mall C in Cleveland are going to draw large crowds. Those are those big green grass areas that are behind uh, the Fountain of Eternal Youth leading up to, you know, if you go toward the lakefront, all those big green areas of grass. Uh, they're expecting a lot of people to see that because that's a big open area So and you have a good line of sight of what's uh, you know in the sky above you. And it says they're expected to have portable restrooms available for use. NASA TV, I think, is also going to be broadcasting from Cleveland, I think particularly at the Great Lakes Science Center. They are just giving advice about parking, transit, and they also have a map here talking about road closures. I think the road closures are mostly limited to the area near the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in whatever this stretches by Burke Lake Front Airport. These blue ones, it sounds like you're still going to be able to drive on them. It just says no parking and no stopping. So there'll be like a parking ban, like you can't park on the streets and you're not supposed to stop. Uh, so that parking ban also extends all the way, I think this is Detroit Avenue. So yeah, so they're probably expecting a lot of people, you know, to want to like, oh, Maybe I can park on Detroit and walk all the way down, but yeah, they're not going to be having that. But there's other areas where you could view it besides downtown Cleveland. You could go to Edgewater Park, although Edgewater Park released something saying no camping is going to be permitted. Like, they don't want people setting up tents and campsites at Edgewater Park, but I'm sure there's going to be a big crowd there viewing it. Probably some people will go to Lakewood Park, various different spots where people are interested in seeing it. Uh, let me catch up on some of the comments here that people are saying. Laura says, hooray, back in Cleveland. Yes, I'm excited for uh, hopefully filming some good content surrounding the eclipse. And I hope to continue filming uh, when Progressive Field's opening day is going to start. So like that particular day, I'm going to hopefully get a lot of good content. I also have ideas for 
if the cherry blossoms are in full bloom, maybe I'll be able to capture that and various various other things. Hopefully I can make the most of it. Anywhere, any place by Sharif says, Hello Poco Traveler, your content is good, but you need to change something to optimize the video. I think you might be referring to uh, some, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'll have to check. I th they might be related to some of the live streams you've seen in the past that are in person, but yeah, that's that's one of the unfortunate things is that uh, the cellular signal is dependent on where you're broadcasting. So if I'm trying to be live and have interactive comments, uh, when I'm actually out on the street somewhere, sometimes the cell signal is terrible. I experienced that a ton in Las Vegas. I did all my videos pre-recorded in Las Vegas, and when I was at my conference at the beginning of March in Phoenix, I attempted several live streams, but I just ended up killing the live stream after a few minutes because it was just buffering and there's no way it would have been enjoyable, so I, that's why I didn't do any live videos from those cities. I just did everything pre-recorded because it's like, alright, at least this way it'll be crystal clear when people end up viewing it back. Cleveland's been the best city by far when I've done my live streams in the past, so I'm hoping when I do these live streams coming up that I still have that good luck, but in addition to that I might also investigate getting like a second cell phone and with a different carrier like Verizon instead of T-Mobile that I have now just to see if that helps with p potential live stream connections because I know it's possible when you look at live streamers like Action Kid who goes to New York, Miami and now he's in uh, countries overseas he's live streaming no problem all the time and I know he does more sophisticated things like I think he has three different things he bonds the cell phone connections together he has hotspots you know, that's that's a big expense, but we'll, we'll see. But yes, I definitely am conscious conscious of that. Ben Clayson says, "Do you think Cleveland will be affected in the Final Four?" Uh, if you're referring to the women's Final Four in traffic, I think it'll be busier, but not necessarily any busier like the eclipse i think it'll be you know far far busier i think it'll just be like oh one of the big you know major events coming to cleveland but i don't think it'll be anything outrageous during that particular time sadie lamp duel says eclipse yes and welcome uh the lakewood park on the solace steps would be the best view of the eclipse you think yeah that's that that'd be a a fun place to certainly view them on those steps i'm just as fun as it would be to like see how all those spots look, uh, I'll probably pick a spot in downtown Cleveland just because that's also where that Guardians game is being played and I want to cover both areas. So rather than me maneuvering back and forth, I'll be able to like capture everything in one thing. But I'm not sure if I'll be, during the total eclipse, if I'll be in Public Square or if I'll be at the like mall B and C or if I will be down by Voinovich Park which is right by Lake Erie you know all those are like certain candidates I could also go to Cleveland State University uh, at their green grass area I know they're planning on hosting like sort of a mini event there in my head my early favorite is the mall B and mall C area initially I was thinking public square because I was like oh this would be cool to document uh, be right in the center of the square and see it, but with all those tall buildings there, I don't know if that's going to like block out the effect at all. And the good thing about Mall B and C is I've streamed there in the past, so it's I've always had reliable connections there. And you still do, do get a great shot of a lot of Cleveland's prominent buildings from there. And uh, if there's a big crowd in that area, it'd be nice to see the amount of people. You'll have clear shots of the sky everywhere. So we'll we'll see how it goes. Okay, so I think that covers the eclipse area. So now let's move on to our next topic, which is Irish Town Bend Park. So something I didn't know is that the work that they're doing on it right now, I think there's a certain part of this article. Yeah, there's so right now all the work that's being done on it is purely like stabilization work, which is, as it says here, intended to prevent a catastrophic. Oh, I think I forgot to change my. Uh, 
there you go, uh, the right sidebar, I forgot to change that over. It's meant to stabilize the hillside because it's trying to prevent a catastrophic collapse that would potentially block the Cuyahoga River's federal shipping channel. Once the hill is stabilized by the fall of 2025, work can begin on building the park across from the river from downtown Cleveland and the flats. So I, I haven't jumped to Google Maps yet, but let me try to do that right now. Uh, Cleveland. You can see even on Google Map there for a second it said Irish Town Bend. But this is the part where I think if we go from West 25th Street on the map we might be able to see it. And these are these are outdated pictures from Google Maps in 2021. But it would be this is West 25th Street, the Detroit Superior Bridge would be over there. So it's the area going downward from here leading up to the Cuyahoga River and all of that. And I've done some other videos in the past that have, where I've stood on this sidewalk and talked about it. But yeah, that's the hill that they're currently stabilizing and I've also talked about the various projects. Well, one of the interesting updates that I saw this week, oh sorry, one other nugget I forgot to mention is uh, I think it was in this article that I also read, they said 250 trees are currently being grown in Cleveland's Kinsman neighborhood and they're going to be transported to the park when ready. So that's that's pretty neat because a lot of times when I think of this and I see, you see that they raised, meaning got rid of all the overgrown foliage that's been there for years, you think to yourself, well how are they suddenly going to transplant like all these new, all this new greenery there? Well, that's a nice insight to see. But the new element that I saw this week is that there's a proposal and sounds like plans moving forward for the incorporation of an Irish Heritage Park that would be part of this whole project and it would be it would compose 20 percent of the park uh, which is five acres I think the whole thing is 25 acres for the park so this is the project that specifically talks about the Irish Heritage site that came out this week and you can see like right here how there's a door frame and if I scroll down keep scrolling down it talks about uh, shows more examples of the door frames and this is this is supposed to be paying homage to the historic neighborhood and the houses or properties that used to be there and I guess when they were excavating all this site they found like a lot of artifacts related to the area and those things may be incorporated too but these door frames would sort of be like sort of a visual representation of the community, Irish community that used to be there. Uh, you can see through these other renderings how they would have things like Franklin Hill and various art, uh, his history related exhibits, uh, other things that may show like a, I'm guessing like a contour map of the area. Cleveland's coal history, more uh, history, and this is a bigger picture showing that up close. So I think that would be another cool tourist attraction that you can create uh, while incorporating this park. So not only are you, you know, redeveloping it into a place where a lot of people can start hanging out and enjoying the greenery of the park and just relaxing, but you, know, you have this portion of the park that now becomes a tourist attraction. So when people visit Cleveland, they're visiting this park, and you know, just imagine the number of pictures. Imagine people have Irish roots and they want to be exposed to that. So that's a really cool, uh, fun addition. Now, granted, anytime you see renderings like this, there's no, there's no like 100% for sure that it's going to happen. But it does sound like this concept is something they do want to incorporate. Will it eventually look how the renderings look? You know, who knows? We'll see. But the idea and uh, plan to hopefully push it forward is at least there and in place. Alright, so our next headline here is Frontier Airlines. So if you aren't familiar, you may be asking yourself, like, Frontier Airlines, why, why is an airline being discussed in a Cleveland-related video? 
well, a couple of weeks ago, March 14th, Frontier held a sort of like a ribbon cutting ceremony and part of it was to promote that Frontier is now going to be offering 30 non-stop Cleveland routes by this summer. So out of all the airlines that are in Cleveland Hopkins Airport, Frontier all, all of a sudden is the one that's really pushing forward to have like the most degree of expansion. So you can see the fun little, <laughs> I wish I would have been there to see this bear mascot and capture a picture with him. Because I, I do end up flying Frontier the most because, you know, you can't beat the cheap airlines. But it's it works for me as a, when I'm doing solo travel and I don't have a ton of luggage with me. But yeah, you can see that was taking place at Cleveland Hopkins Airport, the kickoff ceremony. But specifically, let's dive into the routes that you can now take. So they've added 10 additional destinations for non-stop service and that most of them start in May I think one of them does start in April but now from Cleveland you can go non-stop to Houston now granted some of these may have been covered by other airlines already I'm not 100% sure but whether they're non-stop or not. either way it's good to know that you have a cheaper option with Frontier if, if that's something people want to go for so you have a non-stop from to Houston, to Jacksonville, New Orleans, Myrtle Beach, Austin, Charleston, Savannah, Salt Lake City, Pensacola, Baltimore, and then also Minneapolis and LaGuardia. So that's a you know, really big expansion for Frontier and they're flying fairly often. Like a lot of these routes, well LaGuardia is going to be daily, but the other ones are going to be three to four times a week. So if you're, even if you're interested in like a one or two day trip, you know, you could you could do something like this. Uh, some of these routes, some of the routes with various airlines were cut down during the pandemic. Like I know back in 2019, Delta Airlines had announced a non-stop flight to Salt Lake City from Cleveland for the first first time, and they ran that for probably like a year and a half. But when the pandemic was happening, they first they slowed it down, and then Delta eventually just cut the route. And then it's been about three years with no non-stop route there and now Frontier is like reintroducing it as well as introducing all these other things so that's a big change for Frontier Airlines really putting a big stamp and making Cleveland one of their bigger bases in the country okay so our very last section here is going to be a grab bag of various topics. So we'll start with the women's final four which is uh, going to be coming up at the beginning of April. I don't know if this is still there in Public Square right now or if it was only there uh, like at the start of the tournament but a week ago we can see Pete Merrick shared this cool video. This is near the Soldiers and Sailors Monument and they had sort of a standing life-size bracket so that was, you know, it's a pretty cool inclusion. And then also, want to give credit to Megan B. Kind on Twitter because if you can see the background image that I'm using right now, Cleveland Final Four, I borrowed that from this picture that she took. Uh, I believe that was yesterday, or she at least posted it yesterday. So in, I don't know if this is in front of all the Cleveland script signs, but this has become pretty customary. Like when the Cleveland hosted the Major League Baseball All-Star Game or the NBA All-Star Game or the NFL Draft, uh, in front of the script signs you would see these things pop up. So you can see right here it says 2024 Women's Final Four. And that's at Edgewater Park. So some nice, fun representation for the Final Four. And then a topic that I probably could have covered significantly more, maybe I'll cover it more in a future video, is the Cavaliers and Bedrock unveiling their renderings for their new performance center that's going to be basically in, in downtown Cleveland, kind of right across the street from it. The reason I didn't include it more is because it just came out this morning and I had so many other topics that I was already covering. But I still wanted to at least touch on it because the renderings came out today. Uh, this is this would be like along the Cuyahoga River, so I think if you were in Tower City looking across, 
because you could see like right here is the bridge, the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. So if I'm not mistaken, I think Progressive Field would be like right over here. And then you would go over like the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge and be looking downward into the flats area. But they're gonna have this historic 210,000 square feet training facilities. One, of the, It would be one of the largest in the world. So Cavaliers would use it to be their training center. They would bring it back to the downtown Cleveland area. And it wouldn't just be the Cavs, they would have, I don't know exactly uh, who, it says the facility will be open to the public, offering comprehensive care and access to testing and high training equipment and devices. The center will also include a public kayak launch point on the Cuyahoga River. So yeah, between the Irish Bend, or Irish Town Bend project, this project, we've seen Tower City have renderings in the past of wanting to expand toward the river. It's like you have all these projects that are really like at one time trying to take advantage of uh, the area of the Cuyahoga River. And then down in the flats by Brewdog, they're also developing like houses down there. So we're, gonna, we're seeing like a pretty big transformation of that whole area surrounding the Cuyahoga River and uh, the flats area. So that's very exciting news. Uh, next headline isn't so exciting. I saw this on Cleveland Scene and it's talking about Frederick Bicycle, the oldest bike shop in Cleveland to close this year. Now there is an asterisk to that because if, if you go through the article and read it, uh, it says he's trying to like sell a building and there's potential someone else could maybe buy it and take over the bike shop, at least that's the impression I got. But there's at least a strong possibility that it's going to close this year. If you're not familiar with Frederick Bike Shop, oh, I already have Google Map open open here. Frederick Bicycle. This is just beyond West 25th Street by Fulton Road. So saying you'd have West 25th Street here, the West Side Market is right here. St. Ignatius uh, High School is right here. And then Fulton. I have I think I've done one video that walked past this area when I covered Ohio City. We have, this place has been there forever. I think the article said, God, 141 years. That's crazy. Obviously, different uh, people have operated the shop, but yeah, it's a long time. So we'll see how that transpires. I think one thing that people didn't like was, uh, if, I mean, the article does a good job talking about the history and stuff, but let me see if I can find... Yeah, I, I'd have to read the article again, but I'm pretty sure somewhere in the article it talked about how someone, one of the interested buyers, wants to, like, tear down the building and rebuild into, like, places where people can live. So, we'll see what goes on with that development. But our next grab bag topic is a, it's like a, I'm doing a grab bag topic of a grab bag topic because I'm going to do a couple quick hitters on some Euclid Avenue spots. So on Euclid Avenue near the 5th Street Arcades, a couple days ago or last week, the Best Steak and Euro shop finally opened. This is the one that's supposed to feature the 24 hour operation. So let me, if you remember the 5th Street Arcade, the inside of one of the hallways of the 5th Street Arcade is very busy. The other hallway is starting to diminish a little bit because a lot of places are leaving there. But let's go to Euclid and it should be, I think, right here. Pretty sure it's going to be. Is it in this spot? That's Stone Fruit Coffee. Maybe it's on this side. Oh, well, I think it is around this area. Let me go back to that picture. Yeah, it's next to the Rocket Fizz. Alright, so it's this this one right here. I think this was previously like Yum. 
so this screenshot is outdated but this property right here on this side of the fifth street arcades is where it opened up at and again it's going to be open 24 hours a day it says i wasn't aware of where their previous location is but a lot of people online are aware of it there's because it says it was has a presence in the city since 1968 specifically located near the campus of Cleveland State and you know me being at Cleveland State for so long I swear I should have known or where it's at but uh, that'll be interesting just the fact that there's a 24-hour location that's opening and it had had that sign up in the window for a long time saying coming soon so it's good that it finally launched and is open now so you've got that place but then you also have a mystery you may remember in one of my live streams last year I covered DP Doe which is sort of near uh, near Public Square on Euclid I started seeing posts online about people saying like when is DP Doe going to reopen and then back at the end of January they said we are temporarily closed for upgrades but we'll be reopening ASAP we miss you all so flash forward, it's almost two months later, and there's really no visible update on when they're reopening. Hopefully they do reopen, because you know they were they were pretty tasty when I first first tried that out. That was in the former uh, Jimmy John's location. Another thing that's right next to DP Doe that is coming soon is at the old May Company building the Museum of Illusions. So you can see right here, this is where that Taco Bell Cantina was located and is no longer there. But a tenant is going to be taking this spot called the Museum of Illusions. I guess they have quite a few locations across the country and it'll be, you know, a little exhibit. I'm not sure how much demand there will be, but anytime you get a new tenant, instead of having uh, nothingness there, because that honestly has been you know, even though for as historic of a building as it is, that lower area has been sort of like a eh, like part that you just kind of quickly walk by on Euclid Avenue because it's been deserted or, you know, a lot of people just like linger there who are just lingering for the sake of lingering. So that's encouraging. I think I read that this won't be ready for a couple months, but it's at least noteworthy that they're moving in. And then right next to that in the former... Taco Bell Cantina location. There's no news on what is going to move in there, but they're seeking places. And you can see right here, uh, this person is providing updates saying that there were two showings set up this week for the former fast food spot. This is actually how actually how I found out about the Museum of Illusions because I saw this tweet and I knew this location. And then when I saw this sign that said Museum of Illusions, I was like, wait a minute. I didn't know something else was uh, moving in there. So that's what kind of uh, clued me into that. Alright, so let's see if there's any more comments that came in since I last mentioned it. Jack G says, thanks, great videos. I grew up on the south side of Tremont and rode the CTS buses, rapids for many years. I was standing on the Interbelt Bridge ceremony the day it opened, went to Higby's Maze, etc. as a kid. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, always love hearing people share history. And even like when I come to these other, other cities that I'm visiting, like Phoenix, I picked up a few viewers from Phoenix and they were sharing some stories. So like that just like makes my day anytime I read. Uh, people's like historic experiences and them sharing it because there's a ton of things I don't know so I always encourage people to share their history when you mentioned CTS buses that sort of reminded me one of the things that I didn't get to in this presentation was an article came out in cleveland.com the other day talking about the Cleveland RTA system and various proposals and one of the big things it talked about and I may do this I'll probably cover this more in a future update if there's more traction to the story but it was the Cleveland.com article from a day or two ago was talking about how the city of North Olmsted and RTA really want to put together a BRT that goes down Lorraine Road. And I assume that would include Lorraine Avenue too. And BRT, if you're not familiar with it, is like the bus rapid transit type hybrid thing. So it's not, it's it wouldn't be like the red line. It wouldn't be a red line, blue line, green line thing where it's actually on a train track. 
but if you can imagine the health line, the health line is an example of a BRT. I think they sort of consider the Cleveland State 55 line that goes down Clifton also a BRT. And what it's meant to say is you sort of modify the infrastructure of the road so that you have dedicated bus lane. In the case of Euclid, a lot of Euclid from the Euclid Corridor project over a decade ago, they took the middle lanes and made it so the bus can just traverse or go straight down the middle of Euclid, whereas regular cars go down uh, one lane. That does shift uh, as you get further toward University Circle as, as far as where the bus stops are, but that, that's the general point. It's supposed to speed up traffic, and they've done studies where they say they believe that the health line is uh, reinvigorated the midtown east side of Cleveland neighborhood and various other things and down Clifton Avenue the bus lanes occupy the curb lane where the bus can just fly down there and not have to worry about traffic any time of day so it sounds like North Olmsted and Great Northern want to do something similar where Great Northern it, there's a lot of layers to this potential project but Great Northern would take like Great Northern Mall and redo a lot of their parking lots in change them into mixed use development where they have like residences there and greenery and walking areas I think that would need like a lot of zoning approvals but then that would correspond with this potential BRT that they would have going down Lorraine Road and go all the way to downtown Cleveland so that's that would be a major project I think they've got some funding to look into the concept but one of those things we don't know if it's gonna come to fruition there's other projects RTA is working on like possibly doing a BRT that goes down I think part of West 25th between like Ohio City to uh, Metro and maybe even a little bit further we'll talk about that more in a, another day but now let's go to our next mini topic talking about the Detroit Superior Bridge so this Again, another disclaimer. This doesn't mean it'll actually come to fruition. So like when I first saw this headline, like streetcar deck of Detroit Superior Bridge wins $7 million for a bike and pedestrian path. I was like, oh, that's intriguing. And we've seen these mock-ups over the years. This is underneath the Detroit Superior Bridge where streetcars used to be. And a lot of, some, once a year, sometimes they'll do, they'll open it up for walking tours that they hold under there but now there's some funding to sort of do like research on the possibility of turning that into a bike lane and pedestrian walkway so there's excitement over it but that's that's the thing you want to be clear with this is just the seven million is more so focused on coming up with the plan not the uh, it doesn't mean like oh it's going through and we're actually doing it but you know that's how these things work you do need funding for the planning process in order to make it work and the funding was awarded by the US Department of Transportation from its new reconnecting communities and neighborhood grants program so that's one of the big programs they're doing to try to improve uh, these type of things uh, Marcus Robinson said moved from California to Ohio I love it here and will remain here forever oh that's that's awesome <laughs> I'm glad you love it here Continuing on our grab bag of topics, we're getting toward the end here, but I think we're uh, doing a good job. There's all been a lot to cover here, and we're getting most of it within about an hour. I actually saw this update like 10 minutes before the stream, before I started the stream, and I was like, oh, I gotta include that because I had no idea about this. It says, it looks like they're at the Voinovich Bicentennial Park, and if you're not familiar with where that's at, that's behind the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So I've done walks here where I go down East 9th Street. The free stamp sign would be over here. Then I walk over the Shoreway Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And then you continue walking. So the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is back here. You continue walking past here and check out, you know, views of Lake Erie. So from the renderings, I think it would be located in this corner, but I'm not 100% sure. But anyway, it looks like they're working on having an honor and memorial wall at the Lone Sailor Monument in Voinovich Bicentennial Park. 
unless this currently exists I'm just like completely missing out missing where it is but I'm assuming that this is going to be put together and constructed later this year so you would be nice to have this monument here and the various walls and then they have a few other screenshots not screenshots but uh, renderings of what it would look like let me try to look again does that ah that doesn't really no there's really no greenery in this area so maybe it's maybe it would be down by this way I'm not sure it would be somewhere somewhere in Voinovich Park I'm just not 100% sure exactly where but that's a nice thing and then they're also talking about how you can have uh, be a part of the monument and probably have make contributions to it individual names would be listed along the rank and service dates under the branch for which they serve so if there's someone you want to honor feel free to look into doing that cherry blossoms it's cherry blossom season last year when I did the videos covering cherry blossoms in Wade Oval and Wade Lagoon I think that was first or second week of April uh, the University Circle does a good job of trying to update people as of yesterday they said they felt like the blooms were about 65 percent in bloom and with the weather being on and off it's like hit or miss because some trees are just starting to bloom like this some trees are like more in bloom so you can never hit it quite right you're gonna have some spots that are dead but you can see right here as of yesterday you sort of see some darkish you know buds forming but there's no like all like the full bloom peak they're expecting either like the very end of March and or beginning of April for it to be peak bloom so hopefully I'm able to capture that and do like a nice little pleasant walk around the uh, cherry blossoms we've got jelly beanville 2024 I won't be able to cover this this year but I still can highlight it uh, this is a video he this is the person I featured their Easter exhibit in Euclid Avenue at 25401 Zeman Avenue for the past two years. He's done it for like over 60 years and he does such an incredible job. I follow him on Facebook so I've been seeing his updates over the past several weeks and with Easter being earlier this year he had like a much more hectic time because it was snowing a lot and you know he was still out there in those cold days like putting this all together but he finally finished it I think like two days ago and this person on Facebook had like a nice little quick summary video showing some of the decorations he always gets the new inflatables so like these are new inflatables that you haven't seen in other years there's the blue bunny I feel like I might have seen that inflatable one year but I'm not 100% sure but he updates a lot of these decorations so you always get like a new snapshot every single year so you have big time kudos to him for that uh, extensive and hard work that he always puts forth in that all right let me see do I have okay so that wraps up all of my Cleveland related stuff that I have uh, one thing I did want to touch on which is a you know sad or shocking thing that I found out found this this morning as I'm sure all of you have heard I think this is incredible to, like think about this concept of this was in Baltimore where this ship uh, lost power or lost control and this video slows it down but I can skip forward a little bit fortunately that I think they said this you know you can see like cars are still going on it they said the ship was able to alert someone at some point so they did have time to like shut most shut it off to most of the traffic and good thing it was at a part of time of day when it was very early in the morning like past the midnight hour so if the bridge wasn't fully packed with people but you can see like the ship ends up colliding into one of the beams and the next thing you know the bridge just like comes crashing crashing down or portion of the bridge you know enough and I think there are you know, some fatalities so like when you see it you're like thinking yourself, oh my god because then I think back to various bridges I've traveled on like the last thing I think of is this bridge is gonna suddenly collapse so that was you know a huge thing and then then I start thinking like man I don't know 
I've never been to Baltimore, so I don't know how many bridges they have, but it sounded like that was a really long bridge that was constructed maybe in the, I think it was said the 70s, but I could be wrong on that. But then just thinking about that in my head, like how long would it take to, you know, clear the debris out of there, to reconstruct the bridge, you know, think about the casualties, all, all that stuff. Like it's going to be a major change for a city. Imagine if Cleveland all of a sudden lost, lost one of its bridges, that would be, you know, a huge shift in everything. So yeah, that was a big topic. And then the final thing I wanted to talk about again was uh, the Poco Traveler channel. If you guys, I know a lot of you have been checking it out, but there's me right now. <laughs> but I did have a conference in early March that was in Phoenix, Arizona. So I did a lot of videos covering that and I spaced them out over I think I released them over like a two week span and I'm finished with that now but it started off with the train ride I explored Tempe then I did a bike ride then I after a Phoenix Suns game I checked out uh, how the downtown area of Phoenix looked this video talks about my experience at the conference itself uh, ate at a place called Welcome Diner this is my long video of actually exploring downtown Phoenix I went to the Desert Botanical Gardens got to see a lot of cool cacti. Uh, at, right after that, I took a bus over and found this place, Phoenix's Hole in the Rock, that gave it like a really cool view. Then later in that evening, I went to Old Town Scottsdale and Scottsdale Mall. That was my favorite favorite night because when I went there, I was like, oh man, that that entire area was good for like it doesn't matter whether you're a tourist or a local like I felt like everyone would be visiting that area there were plenty of shops and restaurants for everyone to enjoy and just the whole vibe was really cool and then not only did you have the old town park but you had uh, if you kept on walking a little bit you had the shopping mall with all the high-end stores not that I would shop at those stores but it still like feels like you had everything in one place and then the next video this was my like sort of grab bag videos a part one and part two I explored some neighborhoods a certain district I rode my bike then to get to a place called Arizona Falls did a video showing a tour of my hotel stumbled into some nice murals little short thing on my final day there and then the goofy Buford and Oscar vlog so yeah uh, that's all the Phoenix related stuff hopefully in the next beginning of April you'll start seeing some fun Cleveland videos including those eclipse days so be sure to pay attention to that and thanks for tuning in to this March update everyone if you enjoyed these videos feel free to hit the like button Laura says Cleveland truly is a forest city absolutely beautiful in autumn yes beautiful in autumn beautiful really any time of the year that's that's one of the gems of Cleveland I know the, the cold weather can make people like oh during winter time but so it's really nice to get all four of those seasons and yeah, everything. But yeah, again, if you guys enjoy this video, feel free to hit the like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. And be sure to leave some comments uh, on in the actual comment section after this video post on what you think of some of these projects that are happening in the downtown Cleveland area. Hey, Jeremy. Sorry, <laughs> signing off right now in the video. But be sure, if you, if you missed the beginning portion, feel free to go back and rewatch it. But thanks again for tuning in, everyone, and we will see you next time.